Room, Tench, hut. Any time of the day, 24 hours a day, we have all of our missiles on alert should we need to go to war. Probably the most destructive thing that, that man's ever come up with. Hands on keys. We train these folks uh, to the highest level we possibly can because there is no room to make a mistake. Remember, we are authorized to use deadly force. We are your sons and daughters and sisters and, and fathers and mothers. And we're darn good at what we do. We're the best in the world. This is missile security control. We're in threat condition delta. I'll get them on the road. Alarm situation, problem nine. Captain, launch. If given the law, uh, lawful order to launch nuclear weapons, that's what I would do. Launch, launch, launch. The Second World War ended, finally and decisively, with the fiery infernos of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The genie had been released from the bottle to which it could never return. Mankind had entered the nuclear age. The world has not witnessed the use of a nuclear bomb at wartime since. And with the end of the Cold War, we may think that the threat of nuclear destruction has all but faded. But sealed deep in underground launch capsules, dedicated men and women still stand watch, waiting for the call to turn the keys to Armageddon. The state of Montana shares a 900-kilometer border with Canada that touches three of the four western provinces. Big Sky Country. Montana is the fourth largest state in America, home to Yellowstone and Glacier National Parks. Every year, six million visitors roam its vast, open spaces, with one exception. The helicopters help protect a special crop buried deep in the Montana soil, the largest network of nuclear missiles in the world. And no tourists are allowed. There has been a lot of secrecy that surrounds what we do for a living for uh, over 35 years. Of course, with the end of the Cold War, a lot of those uh, walls are being broken down slowly but surely. The walls of a nuclear missile facility hide many secrets, some of which will be revealed in this program. OK, all of our missiles are enabled at this time. The massive destructive power of nuclear weapons permeates every atom of a nuclear missile facility. I think it's the most awesome responsibility in the free world, but I would submit that uh, any commander of a nuclear unit better feel that way. Malmstrom Air Force Base is situated in west central Montana, 120 kilometers east of the Rocky Mountains. In 1961, it became a long-range nuclear missile facility. This was the first one built and uh, they went for size at the time with the first ICBM base. To understand the psyche of a nuclear missile facility, one has to start at the very core of its existence. This wing exists to deter a massive nuclear attack against the United States of America. Well, there's several effects. This, uh, a weapon, when it goes off, is actually, it, it's a miniature sun. So you're going to have a light effect, a bright flash of light, thermal effects, and those are all happening at the speed of light. And then farther on down the road, you have the blast effects, which happen much slower because they're actually moving things like air and dust, buildings. The initial blast wave is followed by a second wave in the opposite direction. It's called a mock stem. If you 
see the pictures in the movies, it's the actual the dust going out, you knock over vehicles, knock over trees, and then that forms a vacuum, and then that rushes back in and pretty much destroys what was whatever was left standing the first time through. A nuclear weapon is, uh, is the, probably the most destructive thing that, that man's ever come up with. With such destructive power, nuclear weapons place heavy demands on everyone involved in their maintenance, security, and operation. The awesome responsibility does weigh on you sometimes when you think about, um, you know, just the power that you have at, you know, at your fingertips. I put it in their face. Say, you realize that if we're ordered to launch these weapons, we are going to change the face of the planet. It will be different if it's there at all. Do you have what it takes to do that, knowing that we'll be telling you to do that? Absolutely. There's no way you could get through the job without understanding the implications of, of what our job is, but accepting it and trusting that the President of the United States and elected officials are making the right decision is what gets you through your job. Well, it would be very chaotic and, and uh, very nerve-wracking for a time, but um, 20 minutes later, probably wouldn't be a lot left. Yet, less than a mile from ground zero, a human being in a shelter should have survived. From the naive hope of the atomic age to the frontline warriors of the nuclear age, when we return to Forbidden Places. Nuclear weapons were born in the atomic age during the last few years of World War II. By the early 1950s, the world was trying to come to terms with their destructive power. We did some fairly dumb things, especially early on in those test programs, but uh, we may not have had a real appreciation for uh, what we were dealing with. Operation Q, the atomic test program of the Federal Civil Defense Administration, as seen by Joan Cowan, reporter. I was anxious to learn all I could about the various types of houses to be tested. Mannequin families supplied by private industry are to represent Mr. and Mrs. America. Naturally, I was very interested in preparations for the testing of textiles and synthetic fabrics. Rows of mannequins were set up in the open facing the blast. Each item of clothing and each color had been carefully selected to give much needed survival information. I was especially interested in the food test program. Canned and packaged foods are to be tested. As a mother and housewife, this appealed to me. Some foods are to be tested in the house, stored in the usual way. Other foods, including fresh meats, butter, and similar perishables, are to be tested just below the level of the ground at three positions along the main test line. This will expose the food to high intensity radiation without risking destruction of the containers. But it seemed no time at all before the loudspeaker warned. H minus one minute. Put on your goggles. Observers without goggles must face away from the blast. H minus ten seconds. Three, two, one, zero. brought the Operation Doorstep story into the homes of 30 million families, left them wondering how they might be affected. Today, the nuclear threat has all but faded from the front pages of the world's consciousness. I do run across people occasionally who think that all the nuclear weapons are gone with the end of the Cold War, and they're surprised that we're still here. And I understand that. Despite arms reduction treaties, there are still more than enough nuclear weapons to destroy human civilization. The American nuclear arsenal is currently comprised of about 2,800 missiles. 1,800 of those missiles are carried on aircraft. Another 400 on submarines. 
and approximately 600 are land-based. Three of the United States' six nuclear missile wings have been deactivated. Of the three remaining bases, Malmstrom is the largest. Uh, our missile complex is about the size of the state of West Virginia. And our, uh, our crew members and our maintenance technicians and our security force people drive about 12 million miles a year. The 200 missiles at Malmstrom are spread over 37,000 square kilometers and planted about 40 meters under the Montana landscape. Each of the 200 missile launch facilities, or silos, is covered by a huge concrete slab. Which weighs about 110 tons, okay, which uh, seals up the launcher closure against any blast effects or uh, any other type of weapons effects. The missile is monitored and controlled from another location some distance away, known as the Launch Control Center, or capsule. Each capsule is manned 24 hours a day by two crew members known as missileers. It is their responsibility to turn the keys that launch the missile. Okay, let's go ahead and get the key out so we can prep for everything. The launch capsule is connected by an elevator to a larger compound on the surface, known as a missile alert facility. It houses these six security policemen that provide security out here. It houses the uh, missile alert facil uh, the facility manager. I manage the uh, site topside. Uh, also houses the two crew members downstairs that uh, takes care of the LFs, the launch facilities. There are 20 missile alert compounds each one connected to a launch control center. The two missileers in each capsule are directly responsible for 10 nuclear missiles. This is what all of us are out here working for. This is what the security forces are protecting other than the weapons located out in the hole. We're also protecting these crew down here that can actually uh, launch the missiles. The base headquarters is hundreds of kilometers away from most of the silos and missile alert facilities. I'm sitting here in this office without windows, and he's 200 miles away, but I know he's doing the right thing. And I think someone mentioned to you that we had the Russians here last October, and they were blown away by that. They just couldn't believe it. The 200 nuclear missiles at Malmstrom are in the care of 2,400 personnel, specializing in three areas of responsibility. Room, change, hut. Monitoring and operation. Check for adequate discharge of cool air from operating act. Rex. Maintenance and protection. We still have one uh, unfriendly on the site. The seriousness and inherent stress in working with nuclear missiles forges bonds rarely seen in institutions this size. How are you doing this morning, Jim? Fine, sir. Thank you. Have a good weekend? I sure did. Look good. Thank you. You have got to be a family in the nuclear business because you are helping everybody with every little thing to make sure that they can be focused to do the mission. How are you doing today? Good to be back. Good to be back? All right. So there's stress. There's a lot of stress. Stress. Imagine having to turn a key that would result in massive destruction and the death of millions of people. This is what missileers have to prepare themselves for. Room, Tench, hut. Typical day in the life of a missileer, uh, normally we meet uh, in the morning uh, for a pre-departure briefing. Pre-departure briefing. Okay, our mission statement, we provide combat-ready forces to U.S. STRATCOM and other unified commands by continuously operating, securing, maintaining, and supporting 50 Miniman missiles and five missileer facilities. And then we depart for the field. Of course, the drive times with the air here in Malmstrom being such a huge complex, you know, range from a half hour drive time to up to three hours. If nobody has any questions, let's go do the mission. Carry on. The tedium and routine of the missileers' job contradict the seriousness of their nuclear mission. They are locked inside a small metal capsule 40 meters underground for 24 hours a day long periods of boredom punctuated by brief periods of panic. Okay, the message reads, for Malmstrom, for Malmstrom, launch, 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 Charlie 2, Charlie 3, and Charlie 4. When I was brand new, I thought, every time a message would come in, I thought, this is it. 
This is a good message, do you agree? I agree, good message for Charlie 2, 3, and 4. It can get very busy, but a lot of the time it's very, very slow. We receive tuition assistance to help us uh, further our education and being on alert when things aren't so exciting, that's a great time for, for uh, the crew members to be studying. Okay, let's get the key. Get a chance to work on advanced degrees, uh, master's degrees. Okay, the key is inserted, and let's go ahead and strap in and lock our chairs and prepare for launch. Even though it's a job that no one really wants to do, you know, we're there to do it if we have to. Down and locked. Maybe we'll switch down and lock. And you just hope that it's something you never would ever have to actually carry out. Okay, go ahead and initiate and prepare for the co-op sequence. The procedures are very strict, and we don't, I, we practice them so much, it just becomes we're doing the actions, we don't really think about it. I'm in, and we have a successful cooperative enabled. Do you agree? I agree, successful cooperative enabled. We're trained not to really think about it at that point in time. All missiles enabled. I agree, all missiles are enabled. Okay, let's prepare for launch, hands on keys. Uh, you get a chance to think about it and think about the responsibility and the trust that the American people have put in you. On my mark. On Three, your mark. Two, one. Mark. God forbid we're put there. They know that it went through a lot of things before they got there, and they will do their job. If given the law, a lawful order to launch nuclear weapons, that's what I would do. It won't be a monkey reacting. It will be a human being who is taking an action that they have thought about time and time again and are operating under competent authority. I agree. We have missile away and launch in progress indications from... Charlie 2, Charlie 3, and Charlie 4. Do you agree? I agree. Okay, those missiles are gone. Let's see how the blast affected the houses. This is what remained of the masonry house that was not reinforced. Do you remember this young lady? This tattoo mark was left beneath the dark pattern. And this young man, this is how the blast charred and faded the outer layer of his new dark suit. Three, two, three, four, you can bring it on up over. Use of deadly force is authorized on this site. These folks are heavily equipped, heavily trained, very motivated. The most intense security forces in the world when we return to forbidden places. If the missileer is the cornerstone of a nuclear weapons base, then its mortar is the security force. The mission we do is very unique. Uh, one, because of uh, the nuclear mission that we do take care of, and two, because of uh, the actual distance. And uh, our folks spend a lot of time out on the road, a lot of time going from site to site, making things, uh, making sure things are secure, and just as an overall uh, a watch over of all those sites out there. For every missileer, there are almost three security personnel. That's classified the actual number of people that we have posted at any one time. We have a good many. We have a, enough to take care of our mission and then some. Where the missileer is responsible for the monitoring and actual launching of the missiles, the security forces are there to protect the missiles and the missileers from any possible outside threat. We are prepared to deal with a, a terrorist scenario or something of that nature. The security focus is on the missile alert compound. On the surface, little more than a nondescript collection of buildings planted in the farmer's fields of Montana. Well, welcome to Mike 1. This is one of our 20 missile alert facilities out here in the uh, 341st Space Wing. Access to these facilities is very closely controlled. This is kind of a rare occasion. Hello. Hi. Yeah, it's Captain Frank Hauser. I'm here with my team. We have verified all our hand-carried items. We are secure. Requesting permission to enter. Thank you. Each one of the maps have a chopper pad. 
Uh, they use that to support the uh, weapon movements in the field. Uh, anytime we get uh, really stuck out here, you see the snow's just started to fall. We could get as much as 15, 20 foot drifts out here where we can't get onto the site. We can't get down the road to get back home. They'll actually chop a relief out to us. This is where the folks come and relax. Uh, it's got wall to wall carpet in here. The paneling is all new. Take you into our alert uh, facility kitchen. Person doesn't eat, they don't feel good. This is Airman Garza, our site chef. It's a you get a satellite TV with 200 some channels. Like roast beef and roast turkey. We've got computers, so that would take care of some boredom. And then in this fridge, we have all the side items like rice, corn, vegetables, starches. There's books for those who want to read. Yellow cakes. Outside, we've got a basketball court. Basically, everything's microwavable, so it cuts down on cooking time. Beyond these doors, there's sleeping quarters and the restrooms. Uh, this is a, we, we call these four bedrooms. Sometimes you get teams that get stuck. Uh, we get snow or something. They, they can't get back to where they need to go. They'll stop by and we'll give them a room. Facility manager's room. Um, mine and the chef's room looks pretty much the same because we're assigned to the site and there's three of us. Pretty secure, we got a fence all the way around. The priority to the resource is downstairs. Just entered the uh, elevator shaft way. We're heading down to Tunnel Junction at this time. Uh, we're about uh, two stories, two to three stories up, anywhere from 30 to 40 feet. Uh, as soon as we get to the bottom, we'll, uh, we'll be outside the blast door. It leads into the launch control center where we have two missileers working. It's hardened facility. We're not going to be able to get past this door. It's two to three foot thick. It's lead. It's concrete. Uh, steel pins hold it secure. No way we're going to get in there unless they want us in there. If something happens to us up here, we're mostly expendable. Behind this eight-ton metal door may be the most secure room in the world. This is where the keys are turned to launch nuclear missiles. You're treading into a place where very few people um, have ever been, and uh, you know the majority of people don't understand and, and don't even. Some people don't even know it's there. The launch control center, or capsule, is actually a hollow metal container buried up to 40 meters below the surface. It is suspended on shock absorbers to help protect it against the effects of a nuclear attack. Inside, there is enough room for a two-person crew who monitor every aspect of the 10 nuclear missiles under their direct control. We spend the day doing operational checkout and uh, monitoring maintenance, monitoring the security of the missiles. Maintenance is a real significant part of our job. For security reasons, only missileers are allowed inside a launch capsule. However, an identical capsule is used for training simulations. The only difference is that an actual launch capsule has a bed and toilet. The two-person crew serves a 24-hour shift, two or three times a week. Both crew members are awake for 18 hours and alternate for a six-hour sleeping period. I think the scariest point is when your commander goes to sleep for the first time and you're in control of that capsule. It's all you and you're the primary person watching out for your missiles. Another security feature is redundancy. Each two-member crew serves as backup for the other four launch control centers in their squadron. And if anything funky comes up, you know, you just give a courtesy call over or someone might call you and you just help each other out. You know, we're, it's us out there and you need to, need to help each other out where needed. The missiles are known as the Minuteman III and were first deployed in the early 1980s. The current configuration is the result of over 35 years of development. little more than a decade, the first faltering steps of an infant science have become steadier, resolute, purposeful. Yet for all the advances in development of guided and unguided missiles, the tremendous potential is practically untapped. This is the Miniman 3 weapon system and it's a, a, a missile to help uh, uh, protect the United States and delivering its uh, uh, payload. 
At present, these are the JCS-approved missiles with atomic warhead capabilities scheduled to be operational by the end of calendar year 1955. The Titan systems and the systems of the past used to be uh, uh, very powerful, but as we've gotten more accurate and uh, have uh, advanced in technology, we've actually made them smaller because we only want to hit just what we want. You know, we don't want to take everything out, just only the target that is needed. Honest John, a surface-to-surface, -surface unguided free rocket with a range of 13.6 or 14 nautical miles. The story goes, uh, with the Miniman 2, you could hit just about any city that you wanted. And then with the Miniman 3, you could hit whatever building of whatever city that you wanted. And with the peacekeepers they have down at Effie Warren, you could put it through the double doors of whatever building of whatever city that you wanted to hit. The missile is 18 meters high, 1.8 meters in diameter, and weighs 34,000 kilograms, about the same as 28 compact cars. The missile consists of three basic components, a three-stage solid fuel propulsion system, a guidance system with an air range of 120 meters, and the payload, up to three nuclear warheads, each with an explosive power 20 times greater than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. What actually happens is when this missile does leave the hole itself, it, uh, it'll actually fly up and, um, and it won't even arm. Even when it's up in space, it still won't arm. When it's over its target and it's about to hit, it'll ask itself, have I flown enough, you know, far enough to, uh, to release these warheads at these points? And from there, it just kick free and, and it just free falls uh, all the way down. But once it does reach a certain point, the, uh, the shroud right here will actually fall away and exposing uh, the three warheads that are carried on here, or a maximum of three, actually. And then what happens is uh, there are uh, some uh, some uh, devices, explosive de devices in here that will actually crush down on the, on, the, uh, on the material that will help set off the, uh, off the reaction itself. The missiles of the present, either guided or unguided, carry a mighty tactical and strategic impact, particularly in this time of military preparedness. When they move the uh, weapons on the road, they won't move it without a helicopter airborne to be able to surveil the area. Warriors of the sky as nuclear bodyguards. Day and night. When we return to Forbidden Places. Helicopters are vital to the operation of the Malmstrom Missile Wing. This is the largest missile complex in the world, and to be able to cover the whole area uh, within our required time limits, etc., it's difficult to do by ground, so helicopters are an essential part of that. The helicopters are used in a variety of roles, including the transportation of missileers when the snow is too deep for vehicles. One important role is riding shotgun during the transport of weapons or propulsion systems. When they move the uh, weapons on the road, they won't move it without a helicopter airborne to be able to surveil the area. At Malmstrom, helicopters are on standby 24 hours a day. Flying helicopters at night requires special considerations. The crews fly with night vision goggles, or NVG. Ready for your flight, guys? The night vision goggles magnify existing light by 40,000 times. Because of this high sensitivity, the crew must take precautions in the cockpit. Keep from uh, washing out the goggles, the uh, cockpit has to be low light. So you need to bring extra sources of NVD compatible light, finger light, lip light so that you can identify critical instruments or, uh, or other stuff in the cockpit while you're flying. Normal lights in the cockpit will overpower or wash out the night vision goggles. 
but the use of colored lenses prevents this from happening. What I'm going to do here is change out my uh, flashlight from a normal day lens to an MVG compatible night lens. The large white trailer is a transporter erector vehicle. Inside is the downstage or booster section of the Minuteman 3, which contains the solid rocket propellant. Along with the security forces and the missileers, the third critical component of a nuclear missile base is maintenance. Well, today we're at Charlie 10. It's a launch facility here at Malmstrom. And what we're going to be witnessing today is probably one of the most hazardous operations uh, that we do in missile maintenance. Essentially, what we're doing today is we're in placing the booster, the, what we call the downstage of the missile. And that's essentially basically just the bottom end. Same thing you would expect to see uh, uh, in, in the NASA world or uh, what you see in the space lift world. It's just basically just the solid rocket booster portion of the missile. Solid propellant is inherently safe and stable. However, earlier missiles used liquid propellants. Now, the first missile system I started with, the Titan II weapon system, was very dangerous in that respect. We had liquid propellants that were hypergolic, meaning they explode on contact with each other. And in fact, they had a couple accidents uh, when I was on the crew force. Uh, so we, we moved away from that. We have an emergency. Go ahead and evacuate 2,500 feet upwind in the direction of that wind vane right there. The wind. We got this RF mic hookup. If we're going to be anywhere near the downstage, we'll just go off. Yeah, anywhere near the booster, we'll need to go off of this one. Yeah, we don't want to transmit. I'll set through the fire track. Sure this, this door will be rolled backwards. At that point, the uh, transporter director will be raised to a completely vertical position. and then we'll be able to safely lower the booster down into the silo container. The maintenance technicians who are in charge of our maintenance operations in the field are 20 or 23 or 24. They're staff sergeants or senior airmen. Here's your gear. Hey, push that ladder back too. Make sure the sin line sent it in. We look at the age, uh, at uh, the time at which the propellant was poured in that particular booster, and we monitor those times, and at periodic intervals, we will replace uh, boosters just to make sure we have fresh propellant in at all times. The young man who's in charge of emplacing a reentry system on top of a missile, for example, would be about 24. And he's in charge of the operation. There's not an officer out there. Once the missile receives its valid launch commands from the missile launch crews, it will enter a terminal countdown phase. At that point, this launcher closure slab, uh, through the use of some, some good physics and some high explosives, uh, this door will slide backwards on the rails that you see here before us. will slide completely back and through the fence line, uh, ex completely exposing the, uh, the, the top of the silo, the mouth of the silo, so you can get a clean lift off. Taking a training ride in a nuclear launch capsule when we return to forbidden places. Okay, looks like we've got a loss in primary power. Let's go to EPAP. I agree, sir. I'm there. I'm there with you on 419. Step one, following any interruption, the equipment cooling airflow, check for adequate discharge of cool air. Much like the flying world has uh, flying simulators, of course, for the pilots to train in, we have launch control center simulators for our crew members to train in. Step two, DC power panel survival light circuit breaker required, press not required. Do you agree? I agree. Basically, the crew members each get a trainer ride every single month at a minimum. Hi, this is Captain Wyatt downstairs. I need to determine power source again to the LCC, and can you please check out the normal environmental control system? We give our crews scenarios in a script. We have people who write the scenarios 
and they're given free reign on what they want to what they want to cover. Basically, the simulated events that they will, they could possibly see out in the launch control centers themselves. Everything from a small fault, which might be something like a circuit breaker trip thing. They could very well see, as I said, a fire or an, an emergency. Uh, somebody gets injured. Or anything to full scale, all out. A war scenario. We do our very best to try and basically train like we fight. I'll make the call through the Jason LCC. Agree, sir. Calling Alpha. We also have actions that we take if we see someone else uh, who may be tampering with the missiles. I recommend going to step 15. Do you agree? I agree. Okay, going to step 15. Normally, a simulator ride will take three, four hours. And by that point in time, you, you're really involved and, and focused on what's going on in the trainer. Okay, step 16, job control and command post notified. Required if next or EACU malfunction or if primary power has not returned. That's not the case. Do you agree? I agree. There's no room for error when you're dealing with nuclear weapons. And we expect that of every crew member. Let's go back into the checklist. Step one, can you please check air again? They take the training very seriously. I mean, they know what they're going to be dealing with once they get down on alert. And if they don't know, you know, their procedures or, or how to deal with something, then, you know, that can have serious repercussions. They're the most highly trained, highly educated, highly motivated uh, personnel, I believe, on the planet. If the AC emergency fan is operating, but air from equipment racks does not remain cool, accomplish step nine. Otherwise, we're going to step 14. Please check air again. Air from racks. Okay, I recommend we go to step 14. I Do you agree? agree? Go to okay, going to step 14. They're working within a, a set of constraints associated with the nuclear mission, but within that set of constraints, they are thinking every minute of every day. Do you agree? I agree. Okay, step three, not required. Do you agree? I agree. Um, there's times where a crew, new crew member coming online, having just arrived from Vandenberg, would receive four or five trainer rides before going out and pulling his first alerts. Or uh, as a crew member upgrades to become from a deputy to a commander, he uh, takes four or five trainer rides and a check at that point. Do you agree? I agree. I'm out of this checklist. Look great. I didn't see any problems with it. Uh, great. Thanks for the instruction. No, nope, sure don't. Mike, any questions? No, sir. Thanks a lot. Right. Thanks, sir. Good job. We are in the launch control centers so that the rest of the world knows that we're ready to do what needs to be done with nuclear weapons if it comes down to it. And we're darn good at what we do. We're the best in the world. In the Hollywood cliche, a nuclear weapon is hijacked by a rogue crew member who demands a ransom or else. A variety of safeguards make such a scenario almost impossible. But if it were ever to happen, the most likely cause would be stress. It's stressful because we constantly scrutinize our people. Everything we do uh, when we're out in the missile field is, is monitored by uh, eight other people as a minimum. We constantly evaluate our people. We have to be evaluated every month. We constantly train our people. Get at least a 90% on all the tests. We constantly exercise our people. LC equipment shut down. We're not going to do that. Do you agree? I agree. And so, if you will, you're under a microscope or a magnifying glass uh, just about all the time. And there's no question about it, there's a certain amount of stress that comes with that type of operation. To guard against an internal security threat, there is a special program in place at nuclear weapon facilities. Known as the Personal Reliability Program, missileers monitor themselves as well as their fellow crew members. They must report any unusual behavior. That's part of the whole uh, personal reliability program, is to uh, ensure that the people who are interacting with the nuclear weapons are qualified and of the right state of mind. If you're having a family problem at home or whatever, you know, that can be very distracting. And with the business we're in, we want to make sure we're not distracted when we're out there in the field, that our mind's 100% on the job. You know the person and you know what may be normal behavior for them. And if you see something unusual, um, moodiness or troubles concentrating or making mistakes, uh, obviously those things you're required to bring attention to. People get, get the conception of the, the big brother is watching, uh, the playground rules of, you know, never tattle on someone. Um, we're not living on a playground. We're working with nuclear weapons. Playground rules don't apply. We have to be concerned about the good of the, of the all as opposed to concerned about tattling on an individual. Something that's unique to this business in terms of the personnel reliability program uh, we're literally into just about every facet of your life, not only professionally, but personally. Now, there are fairly tight restrictions on self-medication, for example. That doesn't mean you can't take any medications that you need. Of course, we do. But when that happens, you're temporarily suspended 
from the PRP program. An important point is there's nothing punitive about that. It's, you know, you're not being sanctioned for having done something wrong. It's just that we're temporarily calling a timeout on you doing a job associated with our weapon system. I think most missileers realize that it's not uh, one person trying to stab another in the back. It's uh, all of us watching out for each other, making sure the job gets done right. The self-monitoring is probably the most important part of the program. That's the first thing we teach, is that they're responsible for coming to us if they have a problem. And not just because we deal with the kind of weapons that we do, but, you know, because we care about each other. We're a family. We have not uh, had an accidental launch of a nuclear weapon or a loss of a nuclear weapon that, that, that I know about and that I've ever heard about, so yes, it works. Protecting nuclear weapons against terrorists when we return to forbidden places. What would happen if terrorists were able to gain access to a nuclear missile silo? You're about to see the answer. We got a situation 6 Echo at Bravo 9, Bravo 60 Alpha is taken. Okay. Large situation Bravo 9. Mobile portable radio? Yes. Handcuffs? Missile complex map? Yes. Okay, you ready for departure? Ready. Okay, go ahead and go. Okay, Jonesy, you got a covered wagon? Okay. Missile security outpost patrols in the complex. Be advised, we have a covered wagon, a repeat covered wagon situation in the Bravo flight area. Responding units are Bravo 70 Alpha, Cobra 1, 2, 3, ETA of 20 minutes. Lead aircraft is right there. Number two is right here. Number three is the furthest one. Let's go. Down up. When a contingency or emergency happens, happens out in the missile field, key for leadership is to have accurate information on what's going on. Our communication team arrives out at a scenario out in a missile field. They set up to do a couple basic things right, out, right, right from the get-go. They have a digital camera in which they take a digital photo, download that digital photo into a laptop. From the laptop, they send it via modem over the internet back to our command post here, providing leadership with a real-time, accurate pictorial image of exactly what's happening out in the field. Sir, uh, we've got indications that we have aggressors on site. Would you like us to bring up the digital imagery? Show me Bravo 9. Currently, sir, uh, we have uh, aggressors on the front and back side of the site. Okay, I'm gonna fall out and lead. Everybody fall in behind me. Let's go. Security forces are responding at this time, sir. Be a balloon, uh, suburban type vehicle. And this photo is how old? Uh, approximately five minutes, sir. How's that, sir? Is that you gonna take the whole thing by foot? Well, I got two vehicles. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Currently, we have uh, our forces, defender forces, along this ridge. We also have a peacekeeper armored vehicle on the access road. They're going to be uh, merging up and awaiting your permission, sir, to strike the site. Proceed with the recapture of Bravo 9. Here we go. Commit fire. If anybody ever got the inkling that they wanted to touch one of those sites or, or be around one, uh, we just wanted to show that uh, that's not a very good idea. And we have more than enough presence to uh, repel or uh, try just to convince them that that wouldn't be the best idea. We have a, a scanning system that basically monitors the top side. It's similar to a radar system that we can, we can monitor any activity going on top side. Any movement at all uh, can be detected. 
They've been trained in, in several other ways of disarming someone, from everything from verbal commands all the way up to, uh, God forbid, hope we never have to, uh, actually using a weapon on somebody. There are also other types of sensor systems, of variety, different varieties and styles of sensors that are all uh, intertwined together to form an impenetrable net of defense. Top side search at this time. Side appears to return to uh, Air Force control. Moving on. Today, nine countries have nuclear weapons. Another 12 have the potential to make them. Few people would argue that the world would not be better off if nuclear weapons no longer existed. But it's kind of like you let the genie out of the bottle. I, I think if anybody has them, I much prefer that we would have them as well. The genie has reared its head in India and Pakistan, where nuclear devices were recently detonated in a dangerous game of international one-upmanship. In some ways, the world's less stable than it used to be. It was a bipolar world. Uh, you were pretty much either in one camp or the other, and now it's like a knife fight. The first rule is there are no rules. And because it would be a fight with no winners, the goal is to prevent the fight from ever taking place. Our primary mission uh, is deterrence. Nuclear deterrence is what is what we sit down here for. We're unique in the armed forces in that respect, in that you know, we train and train and train uh, to be exquisitely prepared to do a job. We pray to God we never have to do. And it's almost schizophrenic when you think about it. But that's the nature of our business. By the very nature of the mission, maintaining the nuclear deterrent is a secretive affair. The young missileer attends to his duties largely unheralded. But they play a vital role in the nuclear equation. They understand and accept the irony of being poised to release massive destruction in order to prevent total war. The paradox of raising a fist as a sign of peaceful intent.